Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good evening, everybody, or at least good evening for those joining us in the Philippines and elsewhere in Asia. Uh, good morning to those like me on the East Coast of the United States. Thank you so much for joining us for the first session of what's going to be our three-part Oceans of Opportunity Conference. Uh, this conference is being co-hosted by the Center for Strategic and International Studies here in Washington and by the University of the Philippines College of Law and the Institute of Maritime Affairs and Law of the Sea, headed by uh, Professor Jay Batong Bakal, who I will turn the mic over to in, in just a minute. Uh, first, I'd like to remind everybody that this is on the record. You are welcome to quote anything you hear today. We will have a public Q&A after each of the panels. And if you would like to take part in that Q&A, please use the Q&A function on Zoom. So first, we're going to hear uh, a, a panel. Well, first, we'll hear a keynote from Chargé d'Affaires John Law, and then we'll hear a panel on protecting and threatened fisheries. After a brief break, we'll move on to a panel on bolstering maritime domain awareness. Uh, and after today's session closes, I hope you'll all come back and join us in a week for session two and a week after that for session three. Uh, as a reminder, you have to register for those separately, but all the information is on the website and contained in the invitations you received. And finally, before I turn over the mic, I have to thank the uh, US Embassy in the Philippines for their generous support for this conference. I'd also like to thank the University of the Philippines Marine Science Institute and my own colleagues in the Stevenson Ocean Security Project at CSIS for their support in helping bring this conference together. And so with that, let me turn the mic over to uh, my partner in crime here, Professor Jay Batong Bakal. Hello, good evening and good morning to everyone. Uh, nice of you to come and we hope that this will be a really interesting conference. Our keynote uh, speaker uh, is the current Chargé d'Affaires of the uh, United States here in Manila, and he's been here since September 2018. And he uh, is a very experienced diplomat. He entered the diplomatic service in 1990 and was posted in places such as Poland, Panama, and Afghanistan. And he speaks several languages, including Spanish, Polish, Korean, Czech, and French. I'm sure he's going to be, he, by now he will have picked up the Philippine language, especially the more colorful words of our, of our president. So um, without, much, uh, without further ado, let me introduce to you, please, uh, uh, Mr. John Law of the US Embassy here in, in Manila. John. Thanks very much, Jay. And I was ex expressly told not to quote some of the president's more colorful language, so I'll avoid doing that. Uh, but let me just start by saying good evening and good morning to everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we are so pleased to welcome you here today to the first session of the Oceans of Opportunity virtual conference on the eve of World Oceans Day. The U.S. Embassy in Manila is very pleased to sponsor this month-long forum of discussions with experts from the United States and the Philippines about studying, protecting, and advocating for our seas and oceans. I'd like to start by thanking and acknowledging today's distinguished uh, speakers for the first panel on protecting threatened fisheries. We're so pleased to be joined by uh, Gloria Ramos, Vice President of Oceana Philippines, Dr. Kent Carpenter of Old Dominion University, and Dr. Mujikiwi Santos of the National Fisheries Research and Development Institute as well as our moderator, Dr. Laura David, director of the UP Marine Science Institute. And for our second panel, uh, we're so happy to be joined by Christopher Merritt, the Maritime Domain Awareness Technical Advisor at the US Mission to ASEAN, Lieutenant Commander uh, Zaili Kalawi Pakulba of the Office of Strategic Studies for the Philippine Navy, and Rear Admiral retired Nick Lambert, co-founder and director of NLA International. They'll be joining us to speak on bolstering marine domain awareness. Uh, that panel will be moderated by Greg Poling, Senior Fellow and Director of the Asian Maritime Transparency Initiative at CSIS. CSIS and Greg, along uh, particularly with, uh, with Jay at the UP Institute for Maritime Affairs and Law of the Sea, have really been crucial. They've been instrumental in bringing us together and focusing minds on these very important topics. And so on behalf of the U.S. Embassy, I'd like to extend our thanks to both of you. As you all know, June 5th marked the International Day for the Fight Against Illegal, Unregulated, and Unreported, or IUU, fishing. 
IUU fishing cost the Philippines an estimated 63 billion pesos, 1.3 billion US dollars every year. The environmental damage from IUU fishing and poaching endangers the maritime species that produce food and income for millions of Filipinos. There is no greater existential threat to the environment and the livelihood of Filipino fisherfolk than the destruction of the rich marine ecosystem in the West Philippine Sea. The United States is working closely with our Philippine partners to prevent and prosecute environmental destruction, build sustainable markets for marine products, and engage communities in fisheries protection in the West Philippine Sea and beyond. USAID's Fish Right program supports local efforts to address threats to biodiversity, improve governance of marine areas, and increase fish population size and health. Today, we're going to be hearing from people working on fish right and other anti-IUU fishing initiatives and learn more about how to protect Philippine fish and build sustainable ecosystem management practices. Experts in maritime law and maritime domain protection will also discuss how to enhance Philippine livelihoods and food security through increased oversight and strong legal processes. Improved maritime domain awareness and robust prosecution of environmental crimes are critical to ensuring the, Marines marine, the Philippines marine ecosystem survives for future generations. Philippine waters can play a key role in addressing climate change and its impacts. For example, healthy blue carbon ecosystems, which include mangroves, salt marshes, and seagrass meadows can store carbon while also building coastal resilience. And we're also working together to reduce plastic in Philippine waters. Better waste management and innovations in packaging and recycling can help keep debris out of the ocean. Better community awareness can change our relationship to plastic waste. Ocean and reef health help us measure changes in key environmental indicators. And as our speakers today will discuss, the Philippine marine environment plays a central role in global research. Anyone who works in oceanography, fisheries, or maritime law will tell you that despite maritime borders, all our waters are interconnected. The United States is committed to increasing regional and multilateral cooperation on marine issues. Through regional projects like USAID Oceans, events like the Leaders Summit on Climate, organizations like the Young Southeast Asian Leadership Initiative, YSEALI, we are bringing international partners together to take action on improving the management and sustainability of these shared resources. The United States and the Philippines have a long history of cooperation on ocean affairs, spanning all of the 75 years of our diplomatic relations. I know many of our audience members, as well as our speakers, have worked on these collaborative efforts in marine scientific research, fisheries protection, reef conservation, marine debris reduction, and maritime domain monitoring. And we at the U.S. Embassy have been so privileged to learn so much from the experts involved in this program. We're honored that they have agreed to share their expertise with you over the course of this conference. So thank you all for joining us. We can't wait to start the next 75 years of cooperation to protect our oceans. Thanks, Jay. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, and now we are uh, going to get into the meat of our uh, conference, the beginning of uh, this uh, three sessions. Uh, the first uh, uh, panel and the first session will be moderated by Dr. Laura David, of the, the director of the Marine Science Institute. Uh, Dr. David is a teacher, a researcher, and a science communicator. And those of us in the Philippines know how well she does the communication part, uh, especially. Um, we, uh, um, she has uh, made use of uh, remote sensing and modeling to explore how ocean physics influence the distribution and state of ocean flora and fauna. And we are fortunate to have her to be uh, leading and moderating this discussion of our three uh, principal guests. So uh, Dr. David, uh, Laura, uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Attorney Jay. Good morning to the rest of the uh, people in the other side of the world. So for this first session, we are fortunate to have uh, three distinguished speakers. And if I may share my screen, I'd like to introduce them. Okay, so for our first speaker, we have attorney Goli Ramos, who is the Vice President of Oceana Philippines and a member of the Executive Committee of Oceana International. 
she is a very well-known attorney among the prominent environmental cases she has been involved with. We're stopping the offshore oil drilling project in the largest marine protected area in the country, the Tanya Strait Protected Seascape, which the Supreme Court declared in 2015 as unconstitutional. Together with other NGOs and partners, she also helped halt the discriminate dumping of coal ash and a proposed destructive reclamation project within Tanya Strait. Along with five other Filipino environmental champions from the government and civil society, she received the People's Gratitude Movement or the Pasalamat sa Katauhan Award from the United Nations Environmental Program and the Institute of Governance and Sustainable Development based in Washington, D.C. during a recognition ceremony for their outstanding contributions to the environment. Our second speaker is Dr. Kent Carpenter, a professor and eminent scholar in biological sciences at Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia, and an adjunct professor here in Siliman University in Dumaguete, Negros Oriental, his second home. He first started marine biological research in the Philippines as a U.S. Peace Corps volunteer in the research division of the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources way back in 1975 and currently has an active research project on temporal and spatial patterns of population genetics of marine fishes in the Philippines. Lastly, we are joined by Dr. Mujikiwis Delisay Santos, or Doc Muji as we fondly call him. He is a fishery scientist and a marine biologist, widely recognized for his work on aquatic species genetics, assessment and policy studies to support fisheries management and aquaculture for food security biodiversity conservation, and climate change adaptation. He has authored and co-authored more than 100 scientific articles, book chapters, and books, and is currently the editor-in-chief of the Philippine Journal of Fisheries. Dr. Santos is a career scientist for at the National Fisheries Research and Development Institute, an academician of the National Academy of Science and Technology, and is part of the part-time faculty of the Graduate School of our oldest university, older than Harvard, University of Santo Tomas, uh, Manila. So I give you the three speakers. Thank you. Start with uh, Attorney Golly. Thank you very much, Dr. Laura, David. Um, my internet's not cooperating, but I'll try to present uh, this now. Uh, thanks to the Center for Strategic and International Studies, the University of the Philippines, and of course the U.S. Embassy for uh, giving us this platform in this international um, or virtual conference. Uh, and I'll share with you uh, my screen. Okay, uh, I chose this topic because it is very timely and uh, share the experience of Oshana working hand in hand with our stakeholders in ensuring sustainable management of our fisheries. So the Philippines has more than 7,600 islands and in this uh, blue shaded area, these are the municipal waters, which are reserved for our external uh, fisher fox and where commercial fishing is banned. Um, this is the state of our fisheries. Uh, they're still illegal and um, fishing happening. And uh, most of our fishing grounds are overfished. In 2014, which I consider a pivotal year, and the, the year that Oshana established its office in the Philippines, the country was slapped a yellow card warning for doing not enough measures to stop illegal and regulated and unreported fishing. And uh, the response of the government was swift and uh, with good reason. We will be barred from uh, exporting our fish and fisheries products to EU. So these are the features of the new law, which if fully implemented, will really make a difference in restoring abundance to our countries. So um, vessel monitoring system is now a reality. Science-based fisheries management areas is being rolled out and no restraining order for enforcement of fisheries laws for lower court. I'm mentioning this because it's in relation to my presentation. So in 2016, we immediately uh, pilot tested the use of the technology that it works. 
commercial fishers were not so happy in having their the device uh, installed in their boats because they admitted that they fish in municipal waters. And so we use it in our bankas, in the, the boats of our small scale fishers. And uh, we were able to get policy, uh, policy adoption by the Protected Area Management Board in Tanyon uh, to require vessel monitoring uh, for commercial fishers uh, that, um, that pass through the area. And uh, we work with the Department of the Interior and Local Government, which issued guidelines on the regulation and monitoring of fishery activities in municipal waters. The DILG has been a consistent, very credible, sincere, and committed partner in ensuring sustainable fisheries in our country. But the Bureau of Fisheries was not so keen in having the rules on and regulations for vessel monitoring for all commercial fishing vessels. Um, they stopped the public consultation. So we went to the Supreme Court in 2018. We, meaning Oceana, joined by Fisher Fox uh, to compel the Department of Agriculture and Bureau of Fisheries to perform their mandates, which include uh, having the vessel monitoring rules. And uh, we also set up a Karagatan patrol to ensure um, there's updated reporting of apparent illegal co commercial fishing happening in municipal waters. And um, if you can see, uh, there has been, um, when the vessel monitoring rules was uh, adopted, um, there's still low compliance rate, a misly. 10%. We have written the board, uh, the Bureau of, Bureau of Fisheries, of such uh, an alarming uh, compliance, and they charge it to the COVID as the reason for that. And uh, this is the, the regulation when uh, Secretary Dar uh, became the, the head of the Department of Agriculture. He committed to ensure uh, that laws are implemented and um, he issued in uh, October of last year the rules and regulations for vessel monitoring. So the challenges, of course, the commercial fishing industry is alarmed uh, by this and they filed two cases to stop the implementation of the rules. Um, Malabon City unfortunately issued a restraining order on the Department of Agriculture and Bureau of Fisheries, and I mentioned that there is a prohibition on issuance of restraining order or injunction in the enforcement of fisheries laws, and this obviously was not followed. Oceana, together with Fisher Fox, again joined forces in filing a motion to intervene. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court, the, the trial court um, dismissed our motion. So uh, what is the implication of this? Because of that restraining order, uh, about 5% of the commercial fishing vessel fleet in the country can take shelter in that injunction. And I'm glad that uh, Director Gongona issued a clarification to the various regional offices that the injunction applies only to Malabon and the enforcement or the requirement of vessel monitoring continues in the entire country. We're also, very, as I mentioned, DILG has been a crucial partner in the fight against illegal fishing. So it, for the first time ever, to my knowledge, it's the first time a secretary of the Department of the Interior Local Government has issued a warning to, co to coastal authorities, local authorities, for not doing enough to fight illegal fishing. They use technology, which is from the VIRS data, and require them to explain why apparent illegal commercial fishing happening is happening. And we are uh, encouraged by the reaction of this letter on the part of the Palawan provincial government, which crafted a resolution which would be requiring vessel monitoring for all commercial fishing vessels uh, in the waters. Another, another um, journey that they took was um, have a house bill which would allow commercial fishing in municipal waters. And uh, this is stiffly resisted by many sectors, not just the uh, small scale fishers, but NGOs, uh, people's organizations, even local authorities are against this. This will cause further decline of our stocks and it will be a real food security uh, threat.
So as of last week, this is the total of um, organizations which have opposed this, including provincial governments of Antique, Palawan, Southern Leyte, and Davao Oriental. And we have uh, allies at the House of uh, Representatives and the Senate who said that they will not support this. And uh, during the uh, last May 31, the Fisher Fox uh, held a rally uh, calling for the junking of House Bill 7853. So uh, what's our assessment? We are still very hopeful that all of these measures being in, undertaken will enable the country to fight illegal fishing for as long as there is collaboration, there's tra transparency, and there is um, no nonsense enforcement of our fisheries laws. And of course, we are mindful that we are still under the radar of the EU in ensuring that we ins uh, ensure um, uh, responsible behavior in our ocean. Thank you very much. Thank you, Attorney Golly. Um, may I ask the second speaker, Dr. Kent? Thank you. I'll share my screen, I hope. Let's see, hopefully that's clear. Okay, um, first, um, thank you, Dr. David, for that nice introduction. Um, I'd also like to thank all of the organizers uh, of this uh, Oceans of Opportunity event uh, on protecting threatened fisheries. So um, I'd like to talk very briefly about avoiding shifting baselines in Philippine fisheries. So hopefully many of you have heard about the idea of shifting baselines, and in fact, um, this a concept was developed by Daniel Pauly in 1995 when he was still with the uh, International Center for Living Aquatic Resource Management in Manila. Um, and um, the idea here is that the perception and measurement of fishes changes with new generations of ichthyologists and fisheries experts. So it's a very simple concept based on the observation that previous generations saw larger and more numerous fishes, uh, but after long periods of exploitation and in particular over exploitation over time, um, uh, these fishery scientists, the new fishery scientists are used to seeing smaller, less numerous fishes. So, um, you know, for example, in our early history of man, there were many, many fish in the ocean. There's no way that we could put a, a dent in the number of fishes that were in the ocean. But with the um, industrial revolution, the populations, uh, human populations on the earth um, uh, increased dramatically. Um, and even though there was already a very large effect um, on the terrestrial realm uh, by the early 20th century, um, there were still um, only uh, what appeared to be minimal effects in fisheries. Of course, we know that there has been over exploitation of fisheries um, since Roman times and medieval times, um, but the actual problem of over exploitation really didn't come to light until after World War II. And that's when fisheries really became a science um, because um, uh, of increasing exploitation because of increasing um, population levels and demand for fish. Now, um, towards the end of the 20th century, in fact, in around uh, the end of the 1980s and the 1990s, um, the data told us that we were already fishing uh, the oceans to the level where we couldn't catch um, too, too much more fish. And in fact, there are um, or many cases of extreme over exploitation, so that fishery scientists in, uh, in the 21st century, when they see fish, they typically see them much smaller and less numerous um, than what we used to see previously. Now, Daniel Pauly uh, maintained that we really need to keep um, the, uh, the gauge of uh, fisheries um, uh, exploitation levels 
Um, but we need to think of these in terms of the pre-exploitation levels in order to avoid um, uh, the uh, potential for, um, uh, for uh, overfishing and for the potential of um, uh, evolution actually occurring at the, at the level where um, fishes become much smaller and less numerous as, as, and can't go back to pre-exploited exploitation levels. So this is an idea for fisheries. We need to keep in mind uh, the baseline in order to manage fisheries. And this is also a concept that we see being used by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. When they do a red list assessment, they keep the generation lengths, um, uh, they try to keep the generation lengths at the level of uh, pre-exploitation uh, 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 before exploitation in terms of fisheries. So I'd like to give just uh, a few anecdotes about um, uh, uh, shifting baselines in the fisheries. And this is because um, I was a US Peace Corps volunteer in uh, the research division of the Bureau of Fisheries in, in the middle part of the 1970s. Um, I was the head of the Coral Reef Research Unit of the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources. Um, and then after spending uh, several decades focused on uh, other uh, places of the world, I finally came back to the Philippines with several research projects in um, starting around 2005. So I'm able to look at um, uh, keeping in mind what I saw as a Peace Corps volunteer in the 1970s and then getting back in the water and, and doing numerous market surveys around the Philippines as part of Net U.S. National Science Foundation projects, as part of uh, Smithsonian expeditions. Um, there were also uh, several projects um, headed by the California Academy of Sciences, which I participated in. And I've also been involved in um, trying to help um, uh, the Philippines create its own national red list. Um, so um, my, my, uh, what I'll show you are basically anecdotes, but there's a lot of good evidence out there published already. There was a paper um, published in 2016 that used um, uh, uh, surveys of older fishermen in order to understand what species used to be and what species have gone uh, locally extinct. Um, we also are doing some ongoing research on this issue as well. So I'll start off with the largest example of uh, a shifting baseline. And this is the fact that we no longer see the giant grouper um, in the Philippines. Uh, it's, it used to be very common. These are huge fish. They get to be over um, three meters in length. Um, uh, I uh, would see them when I was diving quite frequently in the Philippines. I would see them in the 1970s. Um, there was one place uh, um, in southern Bohol where I was diving, and I would see um, a very large grouper the size of uh, basically a small Volkswagen bug. Um, uh, uh, I would see these um, every 20 meters or so. So they used to be quite common, um, at least in certain places. Um, when I started researching again in the Philippines in the 21st century, um, uh, we did uh, many, many market surveys, including um, uh, starting in 2011 for over seven years. And throughout the um, dozens of market surveys that we did throughout the Philippines, um, we only found one um, uh, giant grouper and it wasn't very giant. It was only around 35 centimeters in length. It was a juvenile and it was found in Palawan. Now um, in the central Philippines where they used to be common, they're extremely rare if they exist at all anymore. Um, and um, the only place where they are reported is in the peripheral areas of the Philippines, in Palawan. Another uh, example of a shifting baseline are the, uh, the fusilier fishes. Now, I did my PhD dissertation on fusilier fishes, so I'm intimately familiar with um, what they called the lagang bukid in the Philippines. 
Um, and there's one uh, fusilier fish, the gold band fusilier. It has a golden band just right underneath the lateral line, well, larger in the front and tapering towards the towards the, the, the caudal peduncle. And these fish are very easy to recognize underwater if you if you're used to looking at them. And in the 1970s, they were very common. I'd see them almost on every uh, scuba dive that I was in. Uh, they were very common in markets. Um, uh, there were huge numbers of these in markets. In fact, if you go to um, the markets in Cebu before, you'd often see piles of these several meters high. And so they were very, very heavily exploited because they're very, very popular food fish, despite the fact that they're um, not very large. Now, during our um, uh, market surveys, uh, starting in the um, uh, in the uh, 21st century, um, we very, very rarely see the gold band fusilier anymore. And underwater, um, I, I have not encountered them um, in probably around 10 years anywhere in the central part of the Philippines. During our market surveys, I on, we only found them in a couple of places. And most recently, uh, in 2017, we saw some in a market in Zambales. And these were most likely um, caught in the in the West Philippine Sea. Um, and the third and final um, uh, uh, example I'd like to give are blennies. Now blennies are very colorful, small coral reef fishes. They're usually only around five centimeters long. Um, these are used to be very, very common on coral reefs in the Philippines. And in the 1970s, I know this, um, because back then we were still using the Navy dive tables. And in Navy, Navy dive tables, if you do repetitive dives, you end up doing a lot of these so-called decompression stops. So you spend five, 10, 15, sometimes 20 minutes um, where you're just decompressing. And um, quite often uh, in order to amuse myself, I would look for um, these small blennies of the genus Asenius. And uh, I would often see three, four, uh, species on each dive. Um, and now in the Philippines, I'm still doing lots and lots of diving here, and they're almost non-existent, at least in the central part of the Philippines. Extremely rare to see even one Exenius um, blenny when you were out diving. So the reason, the question is, is how did this happen? Probably um, overfishing from uh, ornamental uh, fish, fish collectors. So um, these are very, very popular in the ornamental fish trade, and perhaps um, the populations were just um, reduced to the level where they could no longer sustain themselves. Another possibility is that uh, because the larger fish are being um, uh, um, targeted, uh, there are very few large predators left, and the large predators end up eating the middle-sized predators, and then these middle-sized predators are the ones that would normally feed on the smaller fish. So maybe because the middle-sized predators are, are more abundant, because there are no large predators, um, then uh, perhaps it's a trophic cascade sort of a situation here. Regardless, um, the, the, the problem here is that um, they're no longer there. And of course, this reminds me of that Peter, Paul, and Mary song written in uh, <laughs> 1962 about um, where have all the flowers gone? And I often, when I'm underwater, um, end up humming, where have all the blennies gone? So uh, finally, I just, uh, since this is an, uh, uh, an idea of protecting threatened fisheries, I've just come up with a few ideas on how to avoid um, these idea of shifting baselines in Philippine fisheries. Um, first, we need to try to keep in mind, never forget um, the pre-exploitation levels in order for them to, in order for us to focus better on how better to manage fisheries in the Philippines. We need uh, a lot more research done on existing old records. We need to have more interviews of the aging fishermen to understand what they used to be in, uh, in, in the waters and where they used to be. And we need to uh, make sure that when we're training new fisheries scientists in the Philippines, that we um, remind them of the his historical perspective so that this does not become lost. Um, another major point would be that we need to better understand uh, threatened species in the Philippines and how to protect those threatened species. 
And finally, um, one idea would be to um, try to reintroduce into certain areas intelligently those fish that are lost. So we need to use historical records to find out where fishes were and then use the so-called peripheral populations that are still around the Philippines. So we see peripheral populations of some of these species in uh, Zambales and in Palawan. And probably one of the best hopes for our future would be the West Philippine Sea. We need to go to the West Philippine Sea and see if some of the uh, peripheral populations of these locally extinct fishes um, may still be, and in which case we can try to reintroduce them um, into back into the central Philippines. So um, with those parting thoughts, I would just like to say that I've only given three examples of fishes that have gone locally extinct in the Philippines. There are many more. And um, uh, thank you for listening. And I look forward to um, questions after our next distinguished panelist talks. Thank you. Thank you for that, Kent. Um, and finally, we have Doc Muji. Doc Muji. Uh, thank you, Mam Lao. Uh, can I now share my screen? Okay. Again, thank you, Mam Lao. Uh, magandang gabi, magandang umaga, at magandang hapon. That's uh, good evening, good morning, and good afternoon in Filipino to, to everyone. Um, uh, shout out to CSIS, to the U.S. Embassy in the Philippines, and UPMSI for inviting me here. It's truly a uh, uh, a pleasure and a privilege. Now, um, I, I was told that uh, the goal of this conference is to raise awareness of pressing fisheries issues where we can uh, probably do regional collaboration with partners, including the US, and also provide recommendations for tackling those issues. So having said that, uh, I thought of uh, a topic that uh, I will, will talk to you about uh, in this conference. There are now in the Philippines, uh, there are a bunch of topics that we can, we can talk about, but I, I decided to, to tell the story of the Philippine sardine fishery. Why? Because one, uh, we have done a lot of science about, about these uh, uh, species and about the fishery. We, meaning uh, many of the Filipino scientists and even uh, Kent has uh, handled in this one uh, with his uh, fire project and Mam Lau's uh, group in MSI for the models that I will show later. And of course, we have done uh, a couple of management uh, strategies uh, for this fishery. And also, of course, uh, by extension, uh, a number of uh, lessons learned that we are able to share with, with you uh, in terms of the story of the Philippine sardine fishery. Okay, now what we know, of course, uh, the Philippines is really, really very important for the Filipinos and the Philippines. Uh, it's the number one landed small pelagic fish. Uh, it's number two in terms of fishery production overall in terms of volume. Uh, it's utilized as fresh, frozen, dried, smoked, bottled, canned, you name it. Um, right now, uh, for our canneries, uh, they produce about 5 million cans per day during peak season. Uh, the and, um, majority of that goes to the domestic market. Uh, it's a source of livelihood for, again, many Filipinos at billions of pesos in annual revenue. Um, it's one of the cheapest source of protein for Filipinos. And of course, uh, if calamity strikes, who are you going to call in the Philippines? Of course, it's the sardines. Now, uh, we do know that there are uh, as, uh, so far seven species of uh, uh, sardinella uh, in the Philippines. Four at the bottom uh, have just been uh, described or reported recently. We have sardinella albelia, least concerned, gibosa, least concerned, tawilis is in danger. I'm going to talk a bit about that later. Waliensis is least concerned, Lemuro is near threatened, and then S. goni and S. pacifica, uh, these are both data deficient. Um, and uh, have been just uh, recently report, reported in 2016 and 2019 as new species. Okay, so that's that's what we know. But we think that there are more undescribed species of sardinella in the Philippines. Case in point, Thomas et al. in 2014 reported that there are uh, evidence of crypt cryptic uh, speciation in sardinella gibosa, and Kilang um, in 2011 also reported sardinella jushu um, and even reported two types. But uh, again, um, 
um, studies for these species uh, have not been done yet. Uh, hopefully, uh, some students will do this. But again, uh, point is there are, uh, we think there are a lot of uh, more species uh, that can be discovered for the sardinella in the Philippines. Uh, we know that uh, Estawilis or the bonbon sardines uh, is the, uh, has been assessed as endangered under IUCN. It's the only freshwater sardinella in the world, endemic in Taal Lake, Philippines, as you can see in the picture. Now, Tawilis is very important in the Philippines because it's very popular. In fact, when it was listed as endangered in IUCN, uh, it, it was in, in a national news. Uh, uh, and, and there were lots of talks about it uh, during that time in 2019. And uh, after its um, uh, assessment as endangered in 2019, uh, uh, a number of um, management strategies has been institutionalized, like the seasonal fishing closures in March and April, uh, the time of spawning of tawilis. Um, uh, and then also, uh, we're able to identify uh, spawning areas uh, that were declared as reserve uh, areas for, for these species. Um, what's next? Uh, of course, uh, we want to know um, the impact of the red listing to Tawilis conservation and to the fishery in general. As I've said, uh, this, is, uh, this, had, uh, bec uh, this became a national issue and we wanted to, we want to see uh, what happened uh, during that time. Uh, we want to know whether the fishing closure and the reserve uh, areas would be effective for management strategies to sustain the fishery. We need to monitor and study these things. And of course, uh, um, um, perhaps uh, looking at other measures uh, for managing the fisheries like mesh size regulation, managing point source pollution, habitat degradation, and controlling invasive species, which are some of the threats that have been identified. That's why uh, Esta Willis was declared as endangered. Eslimuru or the Bali sardine is the top sardine of, of, of fish uh, landed and also is the preferred uh, species for canning. Um, our canneries are saying that uh, the, the taste uh, and the composition of lemur is perfect for canning. So it has been assessed as uh, near threatened um, in 2017. Okay, um, that's the status of it right now. Um, we did uh, just fairly recently uh, sort of uh, discovered Lemuru in the Philippines because previously it was called uh, Sardinella longiceps, but it's only in 2017 that we found out that the name is incorrect. So we published it in 2012 as Lemuru. Now uh, we are applying for uh, uh, the, the name's inclusion to the EU list of the species allowed for importation via codex because uh, S. Lemuru is not uh, included in, in, in that list in the EU. So what we, uh, what we want to know uh, in the near future, of course, is uh, where can the, the next red list assessment be made, uh, considering that the, there is actually an active seasonal fishing closure for management for these species. I'm going to uh, tell you about that later. And also um, uh, in, in the event of the application for the codex. The Philippine uh, uh, sardines uh, food, um, Slimuro is known as a, now as an omnivorous uh, uh, zooplanktivore uh, by Metillion 2018. Uh, unfortunately, in, in 2020 by Palermo et al, it was found out that Slimuro uh, is contaminated with microplastics, around 85% of the 600 individuals that has been uh, uh, analyzed uh, contain fibers, fragments, and films. Um, and so, um, um, how much is uh, we want to know how much is the influence of, of of food to the population of sardines in different parts of the Philippines? We know there's a direct correlation of food and the population of sardines in specific areas. We want to know uh, whether it's it's same in different parts of the country. Of course, for the microplastics, uh, we need to check the prevalence of that um, in, in the sardines in, in the whole of the country, and also of course uh, look at the impact of the ingested microplastics to the sardine population and to the public health uh, safety in general. What we know, uh, we do, of course, uh, use models uh, to predict sardines probability of occurrence. Uh, I mean, suitable areas where we find sardines, we know about that uh, by Hieronimo uh, 2018 and we continue to do these models. Uh, Pata et al 2021 also looked at the influence of food availability and temperature to the spawning. So what we're saying is that we, we do uh, have uh, scientists who are doing these uh, models uh, for, for uh, predictions. Um, but uh, the, the thing is we, we want to know as the next step would be how can these models be factored in for management strategy, strategies 
um, convince policymakers and stakeholders to use this, uh, these models. As you, as you know, uh, sometimes policymakers don't like uh, a lot of numbers, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is now a challenge for us to how to, to, to mainstream these things. And of course, and how we can use these models to monitor um, uh, project impacts for climate change. Um, in terms of climate change, uh, the sardine fishery in Zamboanga using a, a published uh, vulnerability assessment tool has been assessed as medium vulnerable using uh, data and perception. Uh, we also know that, uh, for example, uh, during El Nino events, the sardine catch increases in, in northern Mindanao, but that's the only place that that, that, that happened. Um, and so we are looking at uh, even climate change and impacts in sardine fishery. Um, uh, and so, uh, but then we, we, we need to do more in terms of uh, looking at that, especially for uh, looking at uh, lessening the vulnerability of sardine fishery sector and also looking at uh, addressing risks uh, to climate change in, in the near future. Um, we know that uh, within Philippine waters and also um, inside the Sulu Sulawesi marine ecoregion bordered by Indonesia, Malaysia, and Philippines, that sardines are, are connected or shared. Um, and, and we know that uh, right now, uh, specifically in the southern part of the Philippines. Um, but what we do not know is that, uh, for example, are, are these individuals connected to the others, like uh, uh, sardines uh, located in the West Philippine Sea or the Pacific Seaboard, uh, or whether connected, uh, are they connected with the sardines in, in, in the south? And then how does this relate to fisheries management areas? As you know, the Philippines has been chopped into 12 uh, FMAs. It's a new sort of uh, a management regime in, in managing the fisheries in the country. And how does this relate uh, in terms of the connectivity of these this fisheries uh, or on these fishes? And then of course, as transboundary species uh, among three countries, for example, what type of joint regional management is needed to sustain the fishery? A number of uh, initiatives has been, uh, is being done uh, about this one. Um, and uh, we need to, to really push for that one joint management strategies for these uh, shared uh, resources. Um, uh, quickly, um, we have uh, instituted a fishing, a three-month fishing uh, closure for uh, uh, Sardinella Remuru and, and other sardines in Buanga Peninsula based on Rola et al. Uh, in marine policy. It's working, unfortunately, a similar sardine seasonal fishing closure in the Visayan Sea based on Napata et al. in 2020. It's not working. Um, um, it is said that uh, there's a, uh, a different type of situation in these two areas, same fishing closure, but one is industry-led, uh, only commercial fisher fisheries in Zamboanga. But for the Visayan Sea, it, in it included commercial and municipal. Um, and so compliance is, is very, very different for both. So what we want to check on, of course, is whether um, what management strategies to complement fishing, complement fishing closure in Visayan Sea, uh, whether spatial protection, for example, of life cycle routes of species improved strategy, like developing or establishing MPA, MPA networks. And of course, uh, is the positive impact, for example, of Sambuanga, this has been a question uh, way before, whether it's a result of the fishing closure or environmental factors or both. Um, and uh, second to the last slide, uh, sardines are historically abundant in Manila Bay and Zamboanga Peninsula. Uh, this was published in Seal in 1908. And uh, this sort of uh, leads us to a question whether were there uh, boom and bust cycles that happened in the, to the sardine population in the Philippines over the years, because we know that this thing happens in, in the Pacific Ocean for the species. Uh, did this happen in the Philippines or not? Yeah, that's important because that uh, uh, sort of uh, relates to uh, the, fish, uh, the current fish, fisheries management that we have. Uh, last slide, moving forward, uh, we have learned uh, a bunch of things in terms of the science and, and the management of these uh, very important uh, commercial species in the country, but uh, we have long ways to go in terms of looking at, uh, again, environmental variability, socioeconomic aspects, spatial temporal fishing effort, we need those. Uh, vulnerability, suitability, vis-a-vis uh, -vis climate projections, uh, we need more biology, post-harvest, trade and marketing is very important, especially import-export, and sardine migration from larvae to adult. That last uh, item has been uh, asked by the sardine uh, fishing, uh, uh, sardine uh, industry sector uh, as one of their main questions before.
So with that, thank you very much. Thank you for that, Bakhmud. Um, we'll be uh, fielding in questions from the Q&A section soon. But first, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all our three speakers and also ask a couple of questions myself. Uh, my first question is to Attorney Golly. Attorney, are you here? Um, I'd just like to point out that both of our fishery scientists, Dr. Kant and Dr. Muji, pointed to uh, changes in our fisheries here in the Philippines due to different stresses, no? Overfishing, pollution, climate change. Um, has Oceania taken on any of these issues? And if you have, what has been the experience uh, in this? The Tony Golly around. He was having technical difficulties earlier. Okay, so um, I'll ask her that question again if she gets to join us again. In the meantime, uh, Doc, Dr. Kent and Doc Mooj, um, what's your take on reducing the 15 kilometer municipal waters, no commercial fisheries down to 10 or eight kilometers even? Doc Kent? Well, um, I've, I've been doing conservation and marine conservation in the Philippines for a long time, and I would strongly oppose um, the uh, the extension uh, or the the re you know extension of commercial fisheries into municipal waters for two reasons that are obvious. Number one, it's going to hurt the local fishermen. Um, this is this will be taking away fish from local people who depend on it more for their livelihoods. And of course, number two, um, they are uh, they're just going to be overexploiting, uh, putting more strain on a resource that already is very, very strained. And I, uh, for one, find it very, very um, uh, strange uh, that they're not that these commercial fishermen are not being forced to put these transponders on their boats because. Um, because they don't want to get caught doing what they've been doing. I've seen these commercial fishermen in municipal waters, and um, it's just not right. We should make sure that that's enforced. Thank you for that. How about Mahmoudji? Uh, hello, ma'am. Not sure if I can <laughs> answer that question, but uh, perhaps can I give a sort of a different answer? Um, our uh, our mandate uh, as an NFRDI is is to provide uh, scientific information for 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 all of or any of, of these issues, and uh, and and to me I think um, uh, 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 there we need to do more in terms of uh, learning about that area um, before we can start uh, discussing these things again. Um, and so I guess I guess that that's my take in terms of my uh, in terms of uh, uh, my mandate as a government scientist is to really look at uh, the data, and produce the information, and then uh, everyone can can discuss. Thank you. Thank you, Doc Mood. Sorry for putting you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> um, Attorney Golly, I'm glad you're back. I asked before, yeah. um, both of our scientists, Doc Muj and Dr. Kent, pointed to the changes in our fisheries here in the Philippines due to different stresses, uh, such as overfishing, pollution, climate change. Has Oceania taken on any of these issues? In, uh, and if so, how has been your experience uh, in, in tackling any of these? <laughs> Thanks so much for the question. Yes, definitely, uh, Dr. Laura. Uh, Oshana's really uh, working, collaborating, especially with our fisher folks. And we know their problems. And uh, regarding House Bill 7853, they said they will be the, the problem of society because they will be displaced. Uh, it's the only li livelihood that they know how. And then for my, for habitat destruction, with wild cases, I mean, uh, unfortunately, it was not well received, to say it 
lightly, but we continue the advocacy. We're in collaboration really with many of the um, NGOs and uh, people's organizations, academe, and also for plastic pollution. We are going to send a notice to Sue already. We have done our part. Um, Republic Act 9003 uh, has a provision for citizen suits. Same with the fisheries code as amended by RA 10654. We believe that the National Solid Waste Management Commission has not perform its mandates for the past 20 years to come up with a list of non-environmentally acceptable products and packaging, which by the definition of the law and the implementing rules and regulations should already include uh, single-use plastics. So um, we are ready to file a lawsuit to compel them to do their job. And we are happy that um, Deputy Speaker Lauren Legarda has filed a resolution to investigate the National Solid Waste Management Commission and looking specifically at this Monday and perform mandate for 20 years. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please do not lose steam in all this fight. Keep going. Thank you. Um, I have a question here from John Brandon. Uh, are Filipino fishermen contributing to this overfishing by themselves? How much are other countries exacerbating the problem of overfishing in the Philippines? So any of our speakers? Maybe Dr. Mooj? So mga Pinoy lang ba? Are Filipinos the only one contributing to our overfishing? Or do you think other countries are also contributing to the problem? Well, uh, I mean, uh... The, stat, the, 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 the fisheries in the Philippines uh, is, is very complicated and uh, there's a lot of factors that, that affects, uh, affects it. Uh, and one is, uh, of course, uh, exploitation. And um, data would show that uh, uh, Filipinos uh, contribute to, to that um, uh, exploitation and extraction. But um, there are also a lot of uh, uh, there. Are, there's also data that shows that there is uh, poaching that happens uh, in the Philippines by 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 different countries, um, and so uh, they also contribute to that. Uh, we just don't know by by how much, um, but uh, yeah, there is evidence that uh, other countries are actually getting um, a lot of stuff from, from our areas. For, uh, case in point, for example, uh, um, this has not been talked about, but uh, there's a lot of shark fishery in the offshore side of the Philippines that's being uh, uh, exploited, not by, by the Philippines, but by other countries. So that, that's my answer. Thank you. Thank you, Doc Mooj. I have another question here. Um, in the Philippines, and considering overexploitation of fisheries, does our country have the technology to determine the maximum allowable catch in certain er areas? In that way, uh, we limit the catch. Dr. Kent, maybe? Calculation uh, of uh, allow maximum allowable catch. Well, uh, I honestly think that's a better question for Doc Muji again, but I will say that the, that the Philippines does have excellent fishery scientists and you have um, uh, the, uh, the know-how to, to, to uh, manage the fisheries. And quite often, in, at least in my experience, um, uh, it's not limited by the, the know-how of the fishery scientists. It's mostly limited by the time that they're given to tackle the many problems in the Philippines and the resources that they're given to tackle it. So, Thank you, Dr. Kent. Dr. Muji, yes. Dr. Kent uh, tagged you, so you have to answer as well. <laughs> yeah, that, that uh, uh, MAC or TAC is, is, is really a, a, a problem for us uh, trying to sort of determine that uh, for the past how many years simply because our fishery is really very complicated. Uh, um, you need uh, a lot of data and, and, and a lot of sort of uh, assumptions, et cetera, to, to have that one. Um, and, and so what, what we do now actually, uh, because it's very difficult to compute that, what we, uh, in the law, what we use now are what we call reference points uh, to, to monitor the, the status of the stocks. Uh, for example, uh, using a maximum sustainable yield, uh, you know, 
spawning potential ratio, for example, number of uh, mothers uh, in, in the fishery, uh, what a CPUE, um, and, and, and a bunch of stuff that we, we now monitor uh, and, and tell us whether the, the, the fishery or the population of a certain species is doing okay or it's, it's, it's going down or it's, it's, it's getting up. So, uh, so that's, that's the thing that we are uh, looking at right now. But for the TAC, again, uh, very, very difficult for, for the Philippines to compute. Thank you for that. Uh, Attorney Golly, uh, yes. what is, we have a question from Philip Chu. What is the degree okay. of illegal and overfishing by distant water fleets in the Philippine waters? And is the amount of fishing impacting local fisher folk livelihood? Okay, we're, we, we are data deficient. That's why we are pushing for the full implementation of the vessel monitoring system or mechanism because that's the only way by which you can say that um, this uh, commercial fishing vessel from other countries had been poaching in our water. So uh, for me, there's no more reason not for the government not to do that. Uh, we have to be very concerned. And uh, what we are doing now is uh, using for municipal waters, because this is where we are focused on, is using satellite technology to use the VIRS data. And we are the ones providing our enforcement agencies on, on this data, which help them uh, a lot. And, and we hope that pretty soon, uh, once uh, all of this, um, system, the use of technology is really availed of by the government and other stakeholders, then we will be in a position to make uh, the necessary action. So right now, it, it's rather a challenge. Thank you. Thank you for that. The next question will actually reveal how you have been uh, spending this lockdown during this pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's asking if what is your opinion on the Netflix piece <laughs> piracy? So, has um, have any of you uh, seen the Netflix special piece piracy? Doc Uh Well, honestly, we we don't have uh, Netflix at home, um, <laughs> and also I I. I there's too much on my plate to to really you know um, watch some of these things. Uh, um, so no, I, I haven't seen. I, I've seen some posts and some opinion, but uh, you know, too many too many things going on uh, needed to <laughs> to do. So I I, I did not. Uh, um, Basically, it's uh, pointing it. out that the fishing industry is destroying the world's ocean. That's the that's the big. That's yeah. great. Can't? Yeah, I can. I can, yeah, my my subscription to Netflix uh, um, uh, expired when I came to the Philippines in March. So, but I can at least speak to the idea that um, uh, over exploitation is is ruining our oceans. So, I, one of the hats that I wear is, of course, with the International Union for Conservation of Nature. I manage their um, uh, red listing for marine species of the world. And um, we know from uh, doing nearly uh, 15,000 uh, red list assessments of marine fishes that the most uh, prevalent threat is fisheries over exploitation. So um, we know that, that, yeah, exploitation, fisheries is the most prevalent threat to our oceans today, at least to the Let biodiversity me, oceans. Right. Let me follow that up with another question, which is, uh, I think, uh, based on your experience, Doc Kent, you'll be the best to answer this. Which region in the Philippines is the most overfished and heavily exploited due to unabated uh, fishing practices, pollution, and global warming? Yeah, I don't want to name any names, but the central part of the Philippines has the highest concentration of sort of the bad type of fishing of anywhere. And I've done a lot of work in the central part of the Philippines. We've done research which shows that much 
a lot of the biodiversity in the central part of the Philippines has been lost historically. And that's because of over exploitation and also habitat degradation. So um, without naming any regions, um, let's just, you know, in particular, I'll just say the central part of the Philippines in my, in my experience. Thank you for that. Um, I have a question from Rappler asking, is the presence of Chinese fishing vessels in the West Philippine Sea affecting the fish stock in the Philippines? Anybody? Anyone? Uh, the food? Well, if, if they're fishing and if they're, uh, there's uncontrolled fishing, then it definitely will uh, or is affecting the, the fisheries there. Um, although uh, that, that's the question. Uh, I, I think for some of those are, they're not really fishing. I'm not, I'm not sure. Maybe uh, the, the other panel can, can answer that. I mean, the, the second, pan, the second uh, panel. Kenta wants to say something, I guess. Go ahead, Ken. So um, part of our argument in uh, The Hague when we were trying to convince um, the, the judges that, the, that there was a potential long-term effect of uh, too, uh, too much fishing in the, in the West Philippine Sea is the idea of connectivity. Is the West Philippine Sea connected to the inland seas of the Philippines? Most of the models show that, in fact, um, fishes that might be overexploited in the West Philippine Sea might affect the fisheries that is occurring in, in the central part of the Philippines. So at least in theory, um, yes, um, it should, in theory, um, be affecting the fisheries in the inner part of the Philippines. However, we still need to do some more rigorous genetic studies in order to confirm that. Thank you. One last quick question. Um, are marine resources still sufficient to sustain the demands of the population? Of the Philippine population, I guess, since most uh, produce are consumed domestically. Well, uh, well, the thing is, uh, a, lot of, a lot of publications and reports as, are saying that, uh, as Kent already pointed out, uh, um, from a baseline of like 50 years ago, it's not the same anymore. Um, there's much fewer fish now than, than before. And so, uh, and even, even uh, our statistics uh, are showing that um, there's already some form of decline there. Um, and so, um, and uh, factored in, for example, climate change impacts, uh, this is a game changer, you no, know, we don't know exactly what will happen. There will be migration. There will be local extirpations, et cetera, et cetera. And so, to me, uh, I, I would hindi uh, ako tataya. I mean, I, I would not bet on uh, the, the 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 marine fisheries right now in terms of uh, hanging our food security there uh, because there's so many uncertainties right now, uh, so many problems. Um, uh, we do a lot. We do we do have some uh, positive things like in the Zamboanga that I mentioned, but there's that's that's too few. And so um, right now the prediction really, in, in fact, it has already uh, surpassed uh, that we we look at uh, sustainable aquaculture or responsible aquaculture, good uh, with good aquaculture practices as our sort of uh, future in terms of uh, seafood supply. Because that one we can control, uh, that one we can do something about it, um, and so to me that that's the direction that I think we're, we're we have to take on. Because again, so so many uncertainties in the marine realm. Thank you. Thank you, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all three speakers. Thank you for all of your sharing and uh, for answering all of the questions. Um, I would like to remind the audience that there is a second session which will be at eight twenty. So please be back in 10 minutes uh, so we can start the second session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mom Lau. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Thank you for, for hanging in there over the break and uh, for sticking around for our second panel here. 
which is going to focus on bolstering maritime domain awareness. As a reminder, uh, I'm Greg Poland with CSIS. I direct the Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative there, as well as our Southeast Asia program. And so in that role, which has heavily focused on monitoring the West Philippine Sea, among other uh, issues, I've had the pleasure to work in some capacity with all three of our, our great panelists, who I'm going to turn to in a minute. First, we're going to hear from Dr. Chris Bermerick. Uh, Chris is uh, the Maritime Domain Awareness Technical Advisor to the U.S. Mission to ASEAN in Jakarta, Indonesia. And in that role, Chris works uh, through one of, I think, the best kept secrets in U.S. security assistance, which is the MODA program, the Ministry of Defense Advisors program the U.S. has, which includes MDA advisors also in Bangkok and in the Pacific Islands and probably some that I'm not aware of. Then we'll turn to Zaili Pakulba, who is a commander with the Philippine Navy and Deputy Director of the Office of Naval Strategic Studies. And we'll close with Nick Lambert, a retired Rear Admiral in the UK Royal Navy and co-founder and president of NLA International. NLA runs the Verimar Consortium of Companies, which works with the Philippine government, among others, to improve maritime domain awareness. And so with that, let me step aside and turn the mic over to Dr. Merritt. Chris? Great. Uh, thanks, Greg. Can you hear me okay? We can, yeah. Great, wonderful. Uh, yeah, thanks again, Greg, for the, the kind introduction. And uh, I'm pleased to be on the panel with both Nick and Jai Li. Um, I also want to thank Chargé d'Affaires Law uh, for the opening remarks, and also particularly for CSIS and University of the Philippines for sponsoring this event. Um, both institutions are doing a whale of a job uh, providing insight, kind of helping to shape the dialogue uh, for a complex maritime region. Um, I would also like to recognize and thank uh, the previous panelists uh, for sharing their perspective on the fisheries. It was quite insightful and I appreciated the slides, particularly on the size and uh, changing dynamic of the fisheries in the Philippines for the past 30 years. Um, so thank you again to them. It, I'm, I'm not going to offer any slides, uh, one of which is I've learned that uh, the more fancy you get in some of these, uh, the more chance there's going to be something that goes wrong with the technology. So I'm just going to offer a brief uh, intervention, uh, intervention here. So first, uh, let me just discuss the meaning of MBA maritime domain awareness, which is generally defined as the effective understanding of everything impacting the safety and security and the marine environment and blue economy. But what do we really mean? Uh, when we say MDA, what do we mean by effective understanding? Frankly, I find this definition of MDA to be a bit broad and vague for the current state of global affairs. Because of the broad definition, the concept of maritime domain awareness is, is interpreted differently. For example, some people see maritime domain awareness as a subset of maritime security, uh, whereby it's relative to intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, focused primarily on detecting vessels and uh, dark targets at sea. Others see it as a means to enhance maritime safety, reducing the risk of mishaps at sea and enabling a more effective response when those disasters occur, whether it's a vessel sinking or something related to pollution. And still others see it as a means to better understand and protect the marine environment. But in my mind, maritime domain awareness is synonymous with maritime governance, governance that is based on evidence and analysis. This leads me to my second point, which is if you want to bolster maritime domain awareness, then the focus should fundamentally be on the use of valid information that will help shape the judgment of all maritime stakeholders, global citizens and policymakers alike. In the absence of valid data, science, research, and dare I say, intelligence, uh, society and policymakers will revert to conventional wisdom and blissful ignorance of maritime domain. But even if there's valid information on the maritime domain, how can that information be used uh, to influence society? How can maritime domain awareness be used to bolster national and multinational maritime governance mechanisms? In the past, our challenge was simply knowing the secrets of the oceans. For example, when a vessel was over the horizon, it was difficult to know where they were or what their activities were. Any damage caused to the oceans was also out of sight and out of mind. But we're in an era whereby new technology allows us to know more about vessel locations and activity and the impact of mankind and climate change on the maritime biosphere. 
This new knowledge has also made transparent the dysfunctional means by which societies and nations attempt to govern the maritime domain. Interagency rivalries and mistrust between nations. Uh, this culminates in stovepipes of information. Uh, also information sharing barriers. And now there's also an era of disinformation and fake news prompting maritime governance stakeholders to even question the reliability and validity of the data that's being presented to them. This leads me to my final point, which is one of optimism. For almost two decades, the United States has pursued and developed maritime domain awareness as a national policy. It was born out of safety concerns and a desire to prevent disasters at sea. It expanded after 9-11, whereby a deeper understanding of crews, passengers, cargoes, uh, was necessary in order to mitigate the potential threat of terrorism. But I'll close by saying I see maritime domain awareness as unifying. I see it as a means to inform society of the realities of the ocean and inland waterways. I see it as unifying for nations whereby trust is gained through transparency. So where do we go from here? And I hope that we can uh, chat a bit more about this during this panel discussion. To achieve this, I offer a few recommendations. One, invest in science, technology, and innovation, not only for the collection platforms, but also for the data science that is required to process volumes and volumes of new information. Second, the National Maritime Single Points of Contact. These are whole of government fusion centers that provide information not only on vessel locations, but all, <clears throat> excuse me, all aspects of the maritime domain. Um, the Philippines, I think, is first among peers in the region with the Philippines National Coast Watch uh, Center in uh, performing this function. And last, and perhaps reflective of this panel discussion and, and the upcoming sessions, public and private partnerships. The use of non-government organizations, think tanks, and other stakeholders to help amplify the awareness of the maritime domain. The information is of little use if it is classified or retained within a small clique of government analysts and policymakers. And having formerly been part of that small clique of government analysts and policy stakeholders, I can say we cannot achieve or bolster maritime domain awareness without public and private partnerships. So with that, I will close my opening statement and turn it back over to you. Please, Greg. Thanks, Chris. Uh, now let me turn the floor over to Zaili Bakulba. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction, Greg. And um, thank you to the organizers of this virtual conference, the CSIS, the US Embassy, and UP Imbus. And I'm very honored to be here with the distinguished panelists or co panelists and have this rare opportunity to share my views today. In this panel, my role is to talk about the greatest challenges and opportunities to maritime domain awareness in the Philippines. Before I begin, let me just say that the views and opinions that I will be presenting are mine alone and does not necessarily reflect the official position of the Philippine government, the DND, the AFP, or the Philippine Navy. The Philippines is the second largest archipelago in the world. We have more than 7,600 scattered islands with almost 2,000 uninhabited ones. And consequently, the mere vastness of first seas in our geography present an enormous challenge to maritime domain awareness, let alone maritime governance. Because of its strategic location and rich marine biodiversity, the Philippines has a great maritime potential to be a logistics and transport, a ship repair, an information fusion, and a marine research hub in the region. Yet the Philippines have not fully utilized the benefits and potentials of the wealth of our oceans to, to support national economic growth and development. In fact, there are very limited intellectual and political discourse on how the Philippines can rally its efforts towards a national ocean policy. In terms of defense and security, the Philippines is both secured and challenged with the waters that surround it. While large bodies of water are considered natural boundaries and provide buffer zones from threats or attack. They also serve as avenues where complex and persistent threats emanate. Maritime security concerns have been increasing for the past decades, not only for the Philippines, but also for the rest of the Indo-Pacific region. These are the evolving new power politics in the region, China's ambitious assertions in the South China Sea, and other non-traditional challenges such as piracy and armed robbery against ships, maritime terrorism, trafficking of drugs, human trafficking, illegal trade of arms, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. 
The importance of MBA in understanding the source of these threats and their impact to the country needs to be stressed. Let me just repeat the definition on maritime domain awareness. Um, it is defined by the IMO as an, effect, as an effective understanding of anything associated with the maritime domain, which impacts the security, safety, economy, or environment. The scope of maritime domain is not li limited to surface activities. It includes subsea, sea, air, and sometimes cyber activities. Therefore, conversations about MDA are not only limited to what is happening at sea or what is only related to defense and security. MDA is, yes, broad and encompassing. In the Philippine setting, the primary challenge of MDA is rooted in the lack of national maritime consciousness, or, or what is also termed sea blindness. We are a maritime nation that there is very little realization of our country's dependency to seas, and that our security is from and towards the sea. The connectedness of maritime security to food and economic security to environmental security and resilience to disasters is still unclear to most. While well, there, there were early research on archipelagic studies and national marine policy, it was also after the discovery of the massive, it was only after the discovery of the massive reclamation by China in the West Philippine Sea that we saw the dire need to further the discussion about maritime security and maritime domain awareness in the country. In fact, the Philippine Navy began to use the term Maritime Situational Awareness in the 2013 Active Archipelagic Defense Strategy, or AEDS, as one of the strategic approaches to support maritime operations and maritime cooperation. As what Mr. Merritt discussed a while ago, MDA is the foundation of an evidence-based maritime governance. We cannot govern what we do not know and understand. But the Philippines still has a lot of known unknowns and unknown unknowns. For example, we haven't fully understood how blue economy can benefit the national economy. In fact, in 2018, the share of the ocean economy to our GDP is estimated at only 3.6%, while the maritime sector only accounts 3.3% of employment of all industries. This means that our consciousness to use our seas to further national development is very minimal. But this kind of national thinking translates to national priorities for funding and investment on not only economic activities, but also maritime defense and security. The other two challenges that are now consequences of, of this lack of maritime consciousness are also reflected in our infrastructures and institutions. As maritime domain awareness is entered on the value of information, it is very important to look at how informa information is collected, handled, stored, analyzed, shared, and collectively assessed and integrated for use. Assured information for MDA entails a robust network and secured information technology architecture with clearly established information flows from sensors, collectors, to end users and to decision makers. At the operational level, the Philippine Navy has included the Maritime ISR as part of the modernization program. This is in addition to the current littoral monitoring stations that are set up in the different coastal areas of the country. We expect improvement in MDA, but because of limited surveillance resources, the sheer vastness in the great depths of our seas, we need more innovative solutions and intelligent systems that are low cost and low maintenance, yet has the potential to provide real information 24 seven. Sensors and platforms are rendered useless without the capacity for sense making. Therefore, the need to learn how to skillfully analyze and integrate this raw data into actionable and functional knowledge is also an indispensable capability development goal. No single agency can achieve MDA. It requires the collaboration and coordination of maritime stakeholders. The Philippines has more than 30 maritime agencies involved in maritime governance. Building strong institutional arrangements to promote national MDA is therefore necessary. The National Coast Watch System was established in 2013 in 2015 to serve as the central interagency mechanism for a coordinated and coherent approach on maritime issues and maritime security operations towards enhancing governance in the country's maritime domain. The NCWC wears two hats, as a policy maker and as a coordinating body. 
but almost six years after its, its establishment, the CWC has not yet fully functioned as the national single point of contact for maritime security coordination. It's still plagued with the birth pains of a newly established institution, the lack of human and material resources to sustain it up, its operations, and the interagency rivalries of maritime agencies that it is supposed to coordinate. To cope with this fragmentation, ad hoc committees and task forces are being created to discuss and address the current complex maritime issues in the country. However, these are not sustainable because of the overlapping functions of these temporary issue-based committees with the official functions of the maritime agencies. Again, the confusion of one hat, what one, what hat one wears comes into play when policymakers dip their hands in operations. So given all this, how do we move forward? What are the opportunities to bolster MDA in the Philippines? We urgently need the, cap the capability to detect, monitor, and manage numerous maritime threats in the waters. The Philippines have good strategic partnerships with maritime powers at the US and Australia to support some of its MDA requirements. But the Philippines has to take advantage of not only acquisition of 10% platforms, but also educational opportunities and technology transfer to develop its own capacity for MDA. Investments in maritime infrastructure and maritime scientific research to support MDA will only increase if there is a national mar maritime consciousness and a national vision to develop an integrated national maritime strategy and policy. As the pandemic impacts many industries in the country, the alternative to seek more maritime-related economic activities should be promoted. The maritime agencies have individual efforts to develop MDA. When and if these agencies learn to swim past this institutional fragmentation, there is an opportunity that these small efforts can be integrated to support the different maritime activities of the country that are not only related to defense and security. Lastly, the National Coast Watch System has the potential to act as the MDA hub of the country to establish a common maritime database of threats and to operationalize interagency information sharing protocols and mechanisms. But it has to revisit its functions and organizational structure to be able to focus on key areas of maritime governance as well as maritime security. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. And now I'll turn to Nick Lambert, who I should point out is the only speaker today for whom this panel is neither too late nor too early since he's based in London. So I think Nick is going to be the freshest among us. Nick? Uh, uh, that's very kind of you, Greg, and I'm delighted to be here. I will say in self-defense, I was on a call at um, 0500 this morning with the uh, Republic of Marshall Islands. So um, so this is, this is actually the perfect time, I have to agree with you. Um, and I, I will just add my thanks to everybody else, to the organizers of this uh, important event and uh, and some of the illuminating presentations that we've had. Um, I've, I've uh, found it extremely helpful. And so many of the comments that have been made by my fellow, fellow panelists in this um, bolstering maritime domain awareness panel, and also the, uh, the more fisheries or oriented panel before, chime entirely with uh, with our findings and the work that we've we've been doing uh, here in in the western european world uh, but also you kindly mentioned project Beramar, uh, which we've had the privilege of working with uh, the bureau of fisheries and aquatic resources in the philippines all remotely implemented during covid because um, we we're all heading to the airport just as the project started and just as covid kicked in so um, a real thumbs up to our counterparts in the Philippines. And, and if I might say, actually, as I, as I think about maritime domain awareness and how it's evolving, I do think that the efforts that are going in on, uh, the initiatives from countries like the states, uh, but the country, the efforts that are going on in countries uh, surrounding the, uh, the uh, ASEAN region is, is really, really impressive. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna wave my arms around a little bit, if I may, Greg, and be a little bit more global uh, just building on what our, our fellow panelists have said. And the first thing to say is um, uh, the technology is already here. Um, it's just not evenly distributed. We don't need to make any more technology. Of course, it will evolve, but we don't need more technology to fix this problem. It's already here. We just need to embrace the data that it can provide. Um, I'm passionate about the fact that we're now in an era of sea vision 
and I think Zaili mentioned uh, sea blindness. That was something that blighted me as a naval officer all my naval career. I listened to my seniors wringing their hands and bemoaning the fact that uh, nobody realised that, uh, that we, our country and, and, our, and our way of life depended on the seas and oceans in so many ways. And yet it couldn't, it wasn't seen by governments and it wasn't seen by uh, corporates and bankers and, and so on. And I think we're now, because of the fact that the technology is already here, we are in that era of sea vision and we can see everything we want to see. We just have to throw sufficient resources at it. And so to, to obtain those resources, we've got to make a business case that works. We've got to make it financially viable. We've got to extract the social and economic benefits that MDA affords us. Uh, and uh, there's been some great references to the blue economy, which I'm really pleased to hear because only 10 years ago, people used to take me to one side and pat me on the head when I talked about the blue economy. Uh, but I, uh, what is now really a concept which is evolving and we're seeing so many national strategies unfolding. So, so C vision is with us, the technology is with us. And I think there are three sort of geographical regions in my mind that we need to focus it in. First of all, clearly nationally, we need to uh, focus on our EEZs. Uh, there are so many countries with amazing uh, resources in their sea spaces um, that don't know the value of them, don't know what's out there, and are not necessarily extracting the greatest benefit from it. Secondly is what I call sea basins. I, I will it complex sea basins. I um, have plagiarized that directly from the European Union's strategies on, on blue economy, uh, but I'm fascinated by uh, those coastal states that surround complex sea basins. Uh, the Philippines is right in the center, as we heard earlier, of a very complex sea basin, but I could also bring you to uh, the Gulf of Guinea or the Gulf of Mexico or the Mediterranean or the North Sea in the English Channel as examples of complex sea basins where nations border the sea space and need to share the information to understand it. And the final thing we must remember is the high seas, what's colloquially known as the high seas, which are those huge spaces out there which are regarded as a global commons. Uh, and if we're to bring the governance to all of these types of sea spaces that Chris, uh, Chris mentioned, um, we are going to have to have that sea vision. What's going to drive us down the route of sea vision? We can get very upset about what we've done to our seas and oceans and, and our passionate speakers in the first panel uh, were very clear about the effects of overfishing, something which is uh, very close to my heart. Um, but what's going to drive this, I believe, is climate change. No surprises there. Um, I can talk till hell freezes over about degradation of coral reefs. We can talk about ocean acidification. For the man and the lady in the street, that doesn't necessarily strike a chord. They'll tut a bit and they'll be sad about it. Talk to them about rising sea levels, which are happening now uh, and are with us and are affecting them. Um, and will affect them more and more over the next two, three, four decades. And there is something that's going to touch them. They need to understand that we have a need to understand our sea space. And so the, the opportunity is to grasp the wonderful data sets that are now available for us, uh, providing maritime domain awareness, and to bring them into those complex sea basins that I talked about to understand what's going on. Just back on the uh, climate change, I personally think that we will, we will start to get a handle on COVID. We, it's, it's painful, it's horrible, but generally speaking, we'll get, it, we'll get it under control. I'm not gonna pontificate about whether or not we're gonna end it. But I do think that in the next 18 months to two years, we will see climate change and the effect of climate change on our seas and oceans achieve the same level of magnitude in terms of, of um, importance and, uh, and urgency that we saw with COVID back in the early months of last year. That is gonna happen in the next 18 months to two years. So all of the experts who've spoken today and the questioners, um, are, we're, in, we're on the cusp, we can do something about this. Cash is going to flow. There will be a lot of people who are not normally engaged in maritime marine awareness, who will want the information that is available. 
So I think um, a couple of other points I would like to make. Uh, one is picking up on this governance issue. Before you have gov before you can do governance, you have to have maritime domain awareness. I, I think Chris made a great point there. So once you've got maritime domain awareness, you can bring governance. One of the reasons why there is overfishing or illegal fishing, um, the illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing problem, is because the business model works. People don't go out there to fish illegally. They go out there to work a business case which generates an income. And that's because we don't govern those activities as well as we might do. A maritime domain awareness will enable us to do so. So the opposite of IUU fishing is legal, reported and regulated fishing. And it works across all the other elements of the, uh, of the blue economy. That business of combining um, regeneration of our environment, a, a process of either flatlining the damage we've done or improving the state of our environment, links hand in hand with the socioeconomic benefits that come from a blue economy approach. And so again, we've got to make business models that work. So I don't think we can just enforce our way to solving the problems of illegal fishing or any other illegal behavior in the sea space. We need to um, incentivize. So it's okay, all very well saying to a fisherman, we are going to track you. What we should be saying is we are going to track you. We're going to use that information to help your business model work better as well as governing the sea space. So how do we play that game? And um, this is going to require us to bring in other agencies. It's a cultural mindset that's got to change. I suspect in the 200 odd participants who've been involved in this, in this uh, conference today, we are talking largely to like-minded people who are all pan, uh, passionate about the marine environment. We need to be talking to structural engineers, to architects, to banks, to financiers, to insurers, to all the, um, uh, the players in the mainstream um, economy, terrestrial economy, and get them to engage in the opportunities that are afforded by the blue economy and so turn the challenges of climate change and the effect on seas and oceans to our advantage. And that's a fundamental cultural shift. Um, Chris mentioned changes to institutions. We're going to have to change the way that we think about our sea spaces and the people with whom we speak. Um, if we're going to reduce the effects of overfishing, we need to give the fisher people different opportunities. We need multifunction projects in complex sea basins, combining aquaculture with restoring fisheries populations, with uh, offshore renewable energies, uh, with creating uh, an exportable crop, say hydrogen from offshore renewable energy that can then be sold on. There are so many things that we've got to do uh, that we will have to change our institution, institution approach. Final, final point is the cultural thing. We need to want to share information. We have got so many wonderful data sets out there, as we heard from our first panelists. Um, we now have the technologies, the computer power and so on to crunch all that data and create information and knowledge. We've got to have the willingness to share data and information across boundaries. And it's boring and it's difficult and it's process. So we've got to have a 24 7, 365 day a year attitude to building the picture of what's going on in the sea space that interests, sharing the information that comes from it, and getting the decision makers across the broadest context to come in and engage to create business models that work and help us to improve our marine environment. And I think I'll shut up at that. I think you'll be pleased to hear. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Uh, let's move into our, our audience Q&A. We have about 25 minutes for questions. If you have a question, please just type it into the Q&A function. And if you could identify yourself and, and your organization if possible so that all the speakers know who, who they're responding to. Let me give the first question to Raisa Robles with South China Morning Post, who asked, uh, what do you think accounts for Filipinos sea blindness? A broad question, admittedly, but I, perhaps we could start with Siley. I feel like um, the cause for the Filipino sea blindness is, is that because we've been um, having problems with our 
own national development. And we, we have been fighting insurgency and uh, secessionism for the past almost 40 years. So the tendency to uh, focus on uh, those priorities, to solve what's inside first, rather than to look outside, um, becomes part of the culture. Also, I, I did a research in Palawan then, asking the people why or how do they feel about the reclamations in the South China Sea, whether they're scared or wh how do they feel um, if China, that, that time uh, China hasn't finished um, their reclamations in the West Philippine Sea. So the locals in Palawan actually said that they are not bothered by what's happening in the West Philippine Sea because they can actually fish uh, in the territorial waters. I mean, we have very rich territorial waters. And so they, th there's this um, feeling of a very low threat perception or a culture of a very low threat perception in the Philippines. Um, I think that affects our sea blindness. Thank you, Sile. Uh, next, we have a question. Maybe I'll start with Chris on this and then move back to Sile on the National Coast Watch System, because you both raised it during your, your remarks. Speak, uh, the uh, participant asks, what, what do you think is preventing the National Coast Watch System and the National Coast Watch Center from achieving its full potential? What functions do you think uh, should be revisited within the NCWS? Chris, do you have any, any thoughts here? Uh, yeah, and I think uh, Shaili can probably go into a little bit more detail. So I'm going I'm to do it more from a macro perspective and, um, and look at it not just from the Philippines, but also the other countries in Southeast Asia, Thailand, uh, with their Maritime Enforcement Command Center, and Singapore, and, and, and Brunei, and a few others. Um, so every country kind of has different problems when it comes to setting up sort of a national fusion center. Uh, some of it is internal rivalries. Um, and kind of uh, concern over monies being allocated and authorities. Others have kind of gone beyond that. Uh, and then it becomes more of a uh, public awareness and promotion. How do you use those centers to inform society? Not so much the government. Uh, the, the operators have learned how to use the data and the information that has become fused together. So for the Philippines specifically, um, my recommendation is kind of stay the course. Uh, these things, these organizational dynamics are normal in any entity, especially during uh, periods where there's uh, budget constraints and resource constraints, but to keep with it and to work more closely with ASEAN, uh, in some ways leading ASEAN efforts and in other ways kind of helping ASEAN set the guidance for the region on how they can empower these fusion centers for all the countries. Because quite frankly, I see this as the best way by which you're gonna get multinational cooperation. Uh, ASEAN is a trusted institution. Um, they do tremendous, yes, there's lots of meetings and yes, it does take a long time to accomplish things, but generally it's always forward progress and it's substantive forward progress. So work more closely with ASEAN on how to find solutions and to set uh, dialogue up to help address some of these issues because it's not just for the Philippines. The same issues for the Philippines will be the same issues in other countries. So, Shaili, I guess I'll pass it back over to you. Thanks, Mr. Merrick. So, the National Coast Watch, as I mentioned earlier, wears two hats. Um, it is a policymaker and at the same time a coordinating body. So, it has a very huge mandate, but very little resources. So, it also cannot sustain its operations. At the same time, it has to uh, it has to be established um, whether uh, or to define the, the difference or distinction of function of NICA, of the National Coast Watch Center, of the National Task Force West Philippine Sea. So we have a lot of um, coordinating bodies uh, on maritime, but um, how this interacts with one another, how they support each other, and what are the resources that are needed to support their operations, those things has to be reviewed. So um, in, in one of the Maritime Symposium that we um, organized, um, in, in the Maritime Symposium that we organized this year, a colleague of mine explained that um, the existing National Coast Watch system is an aberration from 
from the established interagency practice because it has very uh, all encompassing mandate and um, it does policy making, but uh, it reports to the office of the president. Uh, but now it it's a detached agency. So um, those things we have, they, I think they have to review um, the position or where uh, is the national coast watch placed and the uh, uh, the information. Uh, architecture of maritime information to and from the National Coast Watch. Thank you, Sally. Could I uh, ask you a follow-up on this? And I think I'll ask Nick as well, given how he closed. So we had a question from Alan Enrico Alano about this issue of, of fragmentation and overlapping jurisdiction within the different departments of the Philippine government, which I think is, is a universal problem, certainly a problem here in the United States. And I imagine it has been in, in the UK as well in, in Nick's experience. Um, you know, BFAR has responsibility over fisheries. You work for the Navy, whose job is national security. The Coast Guard uh, is, is somewhere in between. What is, I mean, in your mind, the prescription for how to break down these institutional barriers in a way that it can support maritime domain awareness better? Um, can I answer? Yeah, please, um, that's, please. Uh, that's, that's actually a very hard question um, because the, the Philippine Navy um, has three roles. It's, it has a constabulary, a military, and um, a diplomatic function. So it, it supports um, the constabulary function, but at, also at the same time, uh, it assists in, um, it assists other agencies that are um, also lacking in assets. Uh, in the conduct of uh, maritime law enforcement. So there are times that when the Coast Guard doesn't, or the BFAR doesn't have ships, um, they, um, they ride in the Philippine Navy ship and um, uh, interdict in fish, uh, illegal fishing activity. So I think, um, and right now, all of this, um, all of these agencies have Maritime domain awareness efforts, like the Philippine Coast Guard, as well as the Philippine Navy, have um, the littoral monitoring stations or radar stations all over the country. But how this information is being fused together, and what kind of information does the Navy and the Philippine Coast Guard and the BFAR get, um, and how they are being used, is still unclear. Right now, so I think it needs to be. It, there needs to be a consultation uh, that's headed by the National Coast Guard Center, so that it we can clarify uh, what kind of information can be given or can be provided by each agency, and how are they going to be um, integrated together. Thank you, Nick. Uh, same question: How do we get agencies to share their toys with each other? <laughs> it's it's the age old problem. Um, I, I'll go with the uh, comment that was made by uh, Chris about staying the course. Um, get your strategy in place and believe it, but you're going to have to put time in. Um, if you want it all to happen in six months or a year, it's just not going to happen. You have to put something in place and say, we are going to do this and we're going to stay the course and get it to win. And we've got to, um, uh, what's, on our, what's on our side? Uh, there's a question there from John Brandon um, in DC, the Asia Foundation. He, he mentions technology a lot. Uh, my point about the technology being already here, just not evenly distributed, was the fact that, the, that let's just use satellites, for example, the things that fly around in space, they're already there. You don't have to put your own satellite up. You just need to go and buy the data. And we're seeing this data becoming more and more uh, affordable and of greater and greater resolution. So you can get the data. That's the first thing in a way that you just couldn't do 30 years ago. So you can have the data, you can crunch it, and you can uh, create the information. We need to smash those analysts together. We need fisheries analysts sitting in the same um, uh, maritime domain uh, node or center, the terms that are being used by Chris earlier. We need to Put people who do offshore renewables beside, dare I say, oil and gas, beside aquaculture, beside fisheries, all the people who are involved in monitoring 
and operating in these sea spaces need to be in the same room, sharing ideas. That's how they'll find new opportunities. And it's a long, slow, persistent plod. What um, is on our side is that there are more and more very clever people looking um, at startup opportunities and, uh, and commercial activities which can bring new ideas into our, our rather conservative sea spaces. And I think we're seeing more and more of that. So it's getting that message out. There are lots and lots of uh, countries with good examples of strategies. I often quote the Irish and harnessing our ocean wealth. That is a national strategy. There is no Irish politician who cannot tell you that Ireland is nine tenths sea and one tenth land as a result of that. Um, as a result of that strategy, and that's really what we need to do in terms of national sea spaces and the complex sea basins that I talked about. And just to come back to the question um, that, that was asked of Zaili about uh, Filipinos um, sea blindness, I'd just like to point out I don't think that the Filipinos are any more blind than any other nation. I think most nations are pretty, with the coastline, are pretty sea blind. But we're seeing the chinks. We're seeing um, startup companies out there using um, AIS data, for example, or VMS data for different purposes than they were ever envisaged for in the first place. Uh, the, the, the grounding of the Evergreen in the Suez Canal uh, generated a huge debate, um, a relatively small incident. I'm sure there'll be some flak flying back in a moment. But my goodness, that highlighted the importance of global logistics supply chains and the, and the part that the maritime plays in it. So the, that was a very long transmission. The answer is it's difficult and it's boring and it's process. And that's what we've got to do. And you've got to share your data, ladies and gents. You've really got to share your data. If you don't share it, you ain't going to win. Nick, let me follow up with the last part of that question from John Brandon with the Asia Foundation. What is the role of public-private partnerships in helping to distribute MDA technology, and I suppose also helping to crunch the data? Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a great question. I don't think um, anybody has defined it. Um, I, I think it's very early days yet. What the, the, op the opportunity as, is as great as in any other sector, terrestrial or space-based. Um, the business opportunities are there. They just need to be shown to people. So um, that's what's going to create their role. We've got to let the market play in this as well as government. Um, so, so private public partnerships could make a real difference, but both sides have got to understand the opportunity and to share their understanding of that opportunity. I'm involved in one or two uh, in the context of the blue economy. And that's the starting point. How the hell do you get the public, uh, the, the government institution to understand the opportunity? And how do you get the private institution to understand it? And then how do you say to them both chat to each other and see whether or not there's an opportunity here? So that's not a very good answer, I'm afraid, but it comes back to the point that it, these, are, these are the difficult things to do. So we've got to stop running around worrying about the shiny things, the technologies that can fix stuff, and we've got to make these business models, as I call them, work. Chris, let me come to you um, for the next question. And you're welcome to pick up on this, this issue of public-private partnerships if, if you want. But Lucio Pitlow with the Asia Pacific uh, Pathways to Progress Foundation asked about US MDA capacity building efforts. So what is the US doing to share data and provide access to MDA technologies to partners in the Indo-Pacific, like the Philippines? And what model are you thinking about, or is the US thinking about? Um, considering the resource constraints of partner nations? Yeah, thanks for the easy question, Greg. Um, so <laughs> it's, uh, so, so let, me, let me just go back really quick to what Nick was just saying, because I think that will lend in, lead into to this answer um, relating to the public-private partnerships and kind of the innovation and, and getting new entrepreneurs into this. Um, MDA capacity building from the United States has generally been based off of kind of a, I'm gonna say a 20th century or early 21st century precept. Radars, you know, there's vessels that are out there. It's not that they want to be hidden. Um, there was just not a technology available for them necessarily to transmit to us. Of course there was AIS, but there's, you know, limitations to that. 
Um, but just having the architecture and the infrastructure in place to kind of track vessels, much less the science involved with the biosphere and kind of the, the seascape and things. So those are two different lines of effort. One is very much Navy kind of security focused using radars and technologies and satellites generally within the government realm, not shared uh, kind of within the intelligence community. And then the others in the scientific community and never shall the two meet uh, together. But that sort of defined the capacity building. So you had the Department of Defense, you had the US Coast Guard, you had others working with partners more from a security and safety standpoint to find and locate and identify vessels and uh, crew members and things um, that may or may not be a threat coming into your waters. And then of course you had the science community uh, doing their, uh, their research, um, but generally it's not publicly available. This gets back to the sea blindness aspect of it. Other than uh, academics and researchers and others who are interested in it, the broader society isn't necessarily aware of it. Um, that's changing very much so now because of the new technology that's out there. It's no longer uh, limited to just government, government agencies and government resources. So your, your, your question relates to how does the United States government do capacity building? I see it changing. I see it transitioning because of the changes in the technology. Now you can have USAID. Uh, I think Gears was mentioned in a, a prior uh, presentation. You know, we have all of these things that agencies that ordinarily would never have had access to satellite type data before to help gain additional knowledge of what's happening, not only in their own borders, but for shared governance of the, the global commons. Um, so I see a convergence happening. If I were to narrow it down into one area, you see USAID, you see Department of Transportation, you see Department of Defense, all kind of coming to a realization that uh, these lines of effort complement each other. And quite frankly, what we've, we've generally had are lines of effort that were a bit disparate. You know, and in some places in the world, uh, they were very well coordinated, but in other places, they weren't. And um, for whatever reason, organization, personalities, you name it. But I think that the takeaway for this, Greg, is that it's changing, it's changing because of the dynamics. And I also want to say, Post-COVID-19 is going to change everything, especially how we look at food and how we look at sovereignty and, and protection. Um, you know, why ship fish from 2,000 miles away if you can have aquaculture producing the same tilapia or the same shrimp or the same other things nearby? Um, so I don't know how it's going to look in the next five years. I just know that what we're looking at today is not going to be the same and the capacity building efforts have to be very nimble and adapt to these changes quite quickly. Thanks, Chris. I might uh, ask the next question to, to the whole panel um, and just get your thoughts. So Mauro Tonko asked one of the elephants in the room, um, how can stakeholders in the South China Sea or the West Philippine Sea uh, better counter or monitor the increasing use of militia vessels in the region? What role does space-based and unmanned platforms play in this? Uh, and well, there's a lot there, but yes, I, I, I guess that's the question. How, how does one uh, with limited resources better identify and hopefully deter this use of quote unquote fishing vessels in disputed waters? Um, Chris, maybe I'll if you don't mind, start with you and move back down the line. Yeah, um, I think the democratization, if I can use that term, the democratization of the oceans, the availability of the information. What has happened, uh, and Greg and, and CSIS and the Asia uh, Maritime Transparency Initiative has done a great job. You know, what is occurring in the waters is not new. This has been happening for years. But when does action take place? Action takes place when the information is available to the public and then social media begins to amplify this and at that point, the democracies, the people demand action from their governments. You're not going to see that from an authoritarian government. So I'm going to kind of boil it down to more of a, a philosophical uh, area that if you want to address these issues, when you have an authoritarian state uh, or a state doing things and, and kind of exerting its influence, obviously in the waters of, of other countries, it's up to the people to hold their leadership accountable. And that information and that valid data is the best way by which to do it. Thanks, Chris. Sylee, do you have any thoughts here? 
Um, because we have very limited um, sensor capabilities um, in the West Philippine Sea. I think what, and especially that the, um, the automated systems are also unregulated right now. So what we are trying to do is to raise this issue to the um, uh, naval uh, platform. And, and like we have a code for advanced encounters at sea. And what we're proposing is, is um, for ships that deploy their uh, unmanned vessels to also respect um, other um, ships uh, and um, be more responsible that it that, that um, they will not deploy these towards the ship to avoid miscalculation. But in terms of MDA, um, because that's the function of automated systems, uh, it's very hard to detect them and it's very hard to know uh, who is actually deploying them. So that's what we're trying to do right now. Thank you, Nick. Uh, thank you. I, I'm. I think it's a it's a great question, and I love my panelists, fellow panelists' answers. Um, I, I think that the the country that is uh, operating those militias is extraordinarily clever, and they are using an asymmetric capability in a in a very persistent way. This has been going on for decades, and it's now coming to a head. And one of the reasons it's coming to a head is because of the success they've had with their asymmetric approach and the and the units that they use and um, the other thing is because as uh, was just described by uh, Chris they are uh, we can now see what's going on I, as Zaili I, I personally think that we can have all the data we want to see what's going on in that sea space and we can buy a lot of it commercially so the answer in my opinion is to play the same game I like the democratization approach, the sharing of information. It's all about sharing information across those national boundaries in that complex sea basin, as I said in my opening remarks. I, I reckon that if, if, you, if, if there were sufficient resources available in terms of uh, finance to buy data, um, and there was a willingness to share data across boundaries, we could set up a uh, maritime domain awareness um, hub for the whole of that complex sea basin and within three months we'd be having usable data and within 12 months we'd have a very comprehensive picture of what was going on across all aspects not just ships not just boats or fishing boats but the environment and so on it's all about that willingness to share information and maybe uh, a combination of that totalitarian approach, that, that threat in the region, plus the need to understand the impact of climate change and rising sea levels, as I mentioned earlier, maybe those are the, that, that amounts to the impetus that we need, the catalyst that we need to do something about this. And I happen to think that nations like the Philippines are a long way ahead in terms of their thinking um, in monitoring these complex sea basins. Um, and it's just a question of um, gathering round and supporting uh, their efforts and those of other countries. Thank you, Nick. We're almost at time, so I think I'm gonna pull the plug on, on Q&A there, although uh, I'm sure the audience has plenty of other questions and I'd encourage you to reach out either to us at CSIS or, or to the speakers to follow up if you'd like. Um, more importantly, I would encourage everybody to join us for the second and third sessions of, of our conference. So this was just the first day of what I hope is going to be a very exciting event. Uh, we will have uh, day two on June 15th, uh, starting at 8 a.m. in Manila. That'll be June 14th in the evening, 8 p.m. here in DC, uh, starting with a uh, panel on plastics pollution and then a panel on preserving the law of the sea. And then our closing session will be on June 22nd at 8 a.m. in Manila or June 21st at 8 p.m. here in DC, which will start with a, a panel on climate change and close with hopefully a, a positive look at potential regional cooperation. Uh, and as a final reminder, you do have to register for each of those panels separately to receive the Zoom invitation. So I would encourage everybody who's interested to please do that. Uh, and with that, uh, I hope everybody can join me in, in providing a virtual round of applause to Chris and Siley and Nick, as well as to uh, panel one and to all of my colleagues at CSIS and UP and the US Embassy who helped make this event possible. Thank you very much, everybody.